and good morning, Grace Church, and thank you for joining us today, both here and um, at home on YouTube, um, as we um, bring praise and worship to our Lord and Savior. If you can rise as we begin our praise and worship. Uh, the first song we do is Raise a Hallelujah. We've done this for the past few weeks, and it's a great song to sit there and get into a mood and a moment of worship and praise and raising a hallelujah to our Lord and Savior. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so what I'd like to do today is, uh, Joseph, you can bring up the slide. When we get to this part of the song, everybody on this side is going to sing with Jenna, sing a little louder. Everybody on this side is going to sing in the presence of my enemies. All right? So we're going to see if we can pull that off today, Grace Church. If you're at home and you have family members, divide the room. You guys can split up. Um, your kids on one side, you on the other. Um, whatever it takes to raise a hallelujah this morning for our Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. 
Good morning, everybody. I'd just like to say a short blessing for all of our children. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, it says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Lord, we just ask that you would bless these children, that they would become wise in you, that as they learn from your holy word, who you are, what you have done, and how much you love them, that they would grow closer to you, Lord, and that they would grow up in you, becoming men and women who seek after your well, Lord. In your holy name we praise you, Jesus. Amen. Have you ever seen one of these? It's a baby monitor. It's basically what parents use to keep an eye on their kids because when they're really little babies, you know, parents get nervous. Are they going to be okay when they're asleep at night? And so they'll watch over them with baby monitors. As we get older, though, our parents can't really just watch over us with a monitor all the time. Have you ever had a moment where you weren't sure if your parents could see you and maybe you didn't feel that safe? Maybe you got lost in a store or at a theme park or even just walking around town. You might have felt really scared at that moment. Your parents probably felt even more scared. Today, we're going to be learning about a time when Jesus' earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, felt very scared because they were not sure where he was. So join us for Kids Church online, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. You know everything about us, every thought, every action, every flaw, and every hardship. Thank you for loving us despite all our many sins. Thank you for washing us clean and allowing us to be saved in your perfect name. Dear Lord, thank you for your perfect love, your mercy, the lessons that you teach us, and the countless ways you have intervened and shaped us throughout our lives. Lord, please reveal to us any selfish ways within our minds and hearts. And please help us to address those areas so that we can be cleansed in your sight. Heavenly Father, I know that while we will never achieve perfection, we can do our best to live our life the way Jesus would. Please guide our minds away from selfish ambition and pride and towards selflessness and deep-rooted love towards others. Dear Lord, please help us to unite as a church body and celebrate the differences that make this congregation the special place that it is. This is a time of change in our church and around the world, and it is an opportunity for much growth. Please offer us your loving support and guidance during this time of transition, and please have the Holy Spirit work through members of Grace Church to bring unity and comfort. Heavenly Father, I pray that the search committee feels your strength and support as they continue on the search for Grace's new pastor. Thank you for guiding them as they are putting in a lot of time and effort into finding the one that you have planned for us. I also pray that our new pastor, whoever he may be, feels a sense of purpose at Grace Church and that he will feel drawn to us, knowing full well that this must be God's plan for him. I pray for the safety of the frontline workers and anyone returning to work. I pray for the teachers, staff, students, and parents who are all adjusting to this new way of learning that they may be safe and that they remember to be kind to one another. Heavenly Father, I lift all of these things up to you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please rise. I can't wait for you. The same God I've never seen.
to the lyrics of the song. I thought about I want to see a victory through COVID, right? I want to see a victory in Grace Church. I want to see the Lord working in ways um, that are obvious to me. You know, so many times, I mean, the Lord is always working. Amen? The Lord is always working behind the scenes, but it doesn't happen sometimes the way we plan it and the way that we want it to work, and the way we work it out. And so the problem is, I want to see that victory. I want to see it. Now, we have victory in the cross. We have victory in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We have our salvation forever in heaven. But in the daily lives and the things that are going on, I want to see that victory. And the words are pretty simple. In the verse 1, it says, The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Because when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Because my God will never fail. And so when we, see, when we sing these lyrics, don't just sing a song. Really apply them to your heart today with whatever you're going through, whatever struggle you're dealing with during this COVID time, during the just life itself, man. So many times, I don't know about you guys this week, but you, know, you take a, a beating from the devil this week, and you know you're here just to, just to connect with your Lord and Savior. So I want to see that victory today here at Grace Church.
I want to see a victory this morning in our Lord and Savior. If you can uh, be seated as we go into our sermon. Amen to the words of that song. Ooh. This is me trying to multitask. <laughs> Thank you, worship band. Good morning, Grace family. Good morning. And good morning, Grace family here in the room as well. I've been trying every week to just uh, reveal a little bit of something about myself so you can get to know me a little bit more each week. So I have to tell you that I can sometimes be musically challenged uh, when we do something like Chuck did today where he divides the room, this half sing this and this half sing that, I get really confused. I end up singing both parts. <laughs> uh, and I'm actually thankful for COVID masks in this respect because I sing both parts badly. <laughs> We've been asking the question the last couple of weeks, what would Jesus do? Specifically, what would Jesus do if he were part of the Grace Community Church during this time of transition you're in? And the answer we've come up with every week is love and some aspect of love, showing kindness, showing compassion, care. Jesus would also speak the truth in love. And many times when you read through the Gospels, you hear Jesus speaking the truth and doing it with love because we've concluded already that everything Jesus said and did, he said and did out of love. So if we're going to ask the question, what would Jesus do? And one of the answers, at least, is speak the truth in love, then we've got to visit that today as a church community. Um, and I got to be honest with you, in putting together what I would share with you, I started praying about these topics months ago and sketching out ideas. And uh, even each week, I still I come back to God and I say, what do you want me to share with the people? What do they really need to hear? And I keep coming back to this topic. Back in August when I was praying, this topic just kept coming to me. This week when I was thinking about it, this topic came in so strongly into my heart. In fact, a couple weeks ago, when I was praying, I decided this topic was so big that it mattered so much to the life of us here in the Grace family that I needed to make it into two weeks. So this is actually two parts. Jesus gave us a procedure for speaking the truth to each other because he knew we'd get out of sorts. He knew we would say things that would hurt each other, that we'd hurt and be hurt. He knew we would... Uh, slight each other. He knew that we would have conflicts between us. He just knew that was coming. So he said in Matthew 18, if you have an offense with someone, if you've fallen out of sorts, if you have a strained or broken relationship, here's what you do. And it starts with go directly to the person. And I mentioned two weeks ago that this is so important in the life of any church because we often get this wrong because we're afraid. It's hard to go directly to a person and have an honest conversation. It's easier to go to someone else and have the conversation with them about that person. It's easier to talk behind someone's back. It's easier to gossip. It's easier to form a little community of people that you can get to agree with you so you can all be mad at that person rather than go to that person. So Jesus said go directly to the person. That's the procedure. It's outlined for us in Matthew 18. That's next week. Today I'm going to help us get ready, because in order to do that, and to do that well, in order to speak the truth in love in a way that's going to heal a relationship and reconcile people together, you need to prepare yourself. So today we're going to be talking about how do I get ready for a conversation like that. Next week we'll walk through the how-to. And I want to tell you that I believe this is so vital in this season for this church. Because in any church, relationships get strained. In any situation, hurts happen. But when you go through a transitional time, a season like you've been in here at Grace Church, you definitely need to pay attention today and next week and prepare yourself to hear what God has to say so that relationships can be healed. Here's what I know. And I don't know because anyone told me. I don't know because I have insider information. I know because I pastored a church for 25 years. I know there are strained relationships in this community. I know there are hurt feelings. I know hurtful things have been said, 
hurtful things have been heard. I know relationships have been stretched. I know there are people who feel far from the community right now who need to be brought back in. And I know there are relationships that need to be touched with the healing love of Jesus Christ. And sometimes the vehicle to make that happen is honest conversation. Honest, difficult conversation. Speaking the truth in love. So I want to pray, and I'm going to pray for you before we go any further. But as we pray, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And before I pray for you, I want you to ask God to show you if there's someone that, needs, that you need to have a conversation with. To show you if you've been involved in some hurt that needs to be healed. If God wants to use you as a vessel of mercy, ask him right now to show you Is there some person you need to go confess to? Is there someone you need to have an honest conversation with? Is there someone in this community who's just far away right now and needs a conversation to help bring them back? And then as you hear from the Holy Spirit on that, I'd like to ask you to posture your mind and your heart to be receptive to what the Spirit of God will say to you today. We need to have open ears, and we need to have soft hearts. We need to be humble. We need to recognize that sometimes we're the ones that got it wrong, not the other person. And let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And so now, Lord, I pray that you would speak firmly and clearly but gently. We're fragile people that you would speak to our minds and hearts and help us to hear you and give us courage at the end to take action. We're here now, Lord, these next 25 minutes we give to you. Help us to hear you. Help us to hear you. In Jesus' name I pray that. Amen. In the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul says, speak the truth in love, but the context of Ephesians chapter 4 He's saying that we need to grow up together as a community, that we would no longer be infants tossed about by every wave. We would no longer be pushed and shoved, but we would grow up into maturity. And it's in that context that he says this in Ephesians. Oh, that's not what he said. Hmm. Maybe he did. I'm going to see a victory. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. I don't know what I'm doing. There we go. Um, Paul said, instead of acting like babies, let's grow up. Let's grow up together. And here's one of the ways we do it. Instead of getting tossed all back and forth, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Paul is saying here is that we grow up together. We grow together, you and I, in community, and we grow up together, you and I, in community. And one of the ways we grow up is we speak the truth in love to each other. This is really hard to do well. That's why I'm taking two weeks to talk about it. We have to really prepare our hearts and minds to speak the truth in love. Because there are a lot of ways to speak the truth, and it's not loving. I've had these words said to me. Rich, I have something I have to tell you, and I say this in love. And that everything that came next had nothing to do with love. It had to do with blame and pointing the finger and self-justification. Whether I was right or wrong in that conversation, there was very little love involved. Saying, I want to speak the truth in love, doesn't mean you're actually doing it. But speaking the truth in love can heal broken hearts. And that's the point today. When you speak the truth in love, it's to heal broken hearts and heal broken relationships. Last week in the time that I spent with you, I led you as a community in a very pastoral way, trying to create space for the Spirit of God to touch you. We invited Jesus to care for you and wash your feet here and at home. Today and next week, I'm going to lead you in a very instructional way, where last week I was pastoral. Today and next week, I'm just I'm a teacher. And I'm intending to teach you today four steps for you to follow to prepare yourself to speak the truth in love, which we'll talk about next week going through the procedures Jesus gave us. And the first step, if you're thinking 
that there's someone you need to have an honest conversation with and your heart starts to pick up the beat a little bit and your adrenaline starts to spike because you think this could be hard, your very first step to prepare for an honest conversation is to check your motivation. It's to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why would I want to have a conversation with this other person? There's one really good answer for that. It's to help healing happen and to restore relationships. But you have to make sure that's the real answer because as broken human beings being redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, we sometimes get that wrong. Sometimes it's about self-justification. Sometimes I want to do a dump and run. Sometimes I want to tell someone else the truth because it's going to make me feel better. Sometimes I want my side of the story heard. Sometimes I want to, I want to show that I'm right. I want to prove I was the right one. So you have to ask yourself, why am I having this conversation? What's on my mind and what's my goal? Step one is check my motivation. Because if my motivation's off, that conversation's not going to go well. First, check my motivation. Here's a, uh, two examples of Jesus speaking the truth in love. And I think you'll probably recognize both of them. The first one is Jesus is addressing the Pharisees and the religious teachers of his day. And there are, there's a whole chapter full of these woe to you's. I just picked this one. Jesus is saying, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Jesus right here is speaking the truth. I believe he's speaking the truth in love because Jesus did everything in love, but it's very difficult to read these words gently. It's very difficult to read these words with a kind inflection. Jesus is being very direct here in speaking the truth. Jesus also has the character and the godliness and the righteousness and the holiness to pull something like that off. If I imagine myself into a scenario like that, I may not be able to pull it off without sinning. I might start feeling very satisfied that I was able to say things like that. You, you're all gnarly on the inside and whitewashed on the outside, and I came to show you your hypocrisy. It would be very difficult for me <laughs> to start a conversation like that and not sin. It might feel good, but I don't know if I could do it. So if you're picturing, if you're imagining, I have to have this conversation with somebody, and my motivation is to point out their sin, or to show them their hypocrisy, I might not be starting with the right motivation, and I might not be able to pull it off in the same manner that Jesus did, because I may not have the same character and godliness and righteousness and holiness that Jesus does. Here's another one. So a rich, young, powerful man comes to Jesus and asks him, Jesus, how do I get to heaven? How do I inherit the kingdom of heaven? And uh, Jesus says to him, keep all the commandments. And he says, this I do. And Jesus recognizes that this man is counting on his own self-righteousness, his own achievement, his own power, his own standing, his own good. And Jesus speaks these words of truth to him. In Matthew 19, he says, Then, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. This is an example of Jesus speaking the truth in love. In this example, Jesus knew what was on the man's heart. He knew that the man was trusting in his own righteousness and spoke these words to him in love, with the hope, I believe, that the man would receive those words in a humble way, would say, wow, you're right. I am holding on to all the things of this world, and I need to put them down and really follow you. That's not what happened in that moment. He walked away sad. But in this scenario, at least for me, if I want to ask what would Jesus do, and I want to pattern myself after him, this one looks a little safer to me. Because I can read that with some gentleness. I can read that with some compassion. I can read that with some kindness. I can read that and say, oh, I get that. Jesus was really trying to help that person. It was really about the other person. 
And what Jesus was doing was speaking the truth to him in love. So if I've got a model, either that first example or the second one, for me, in my state, if I want to be able to do this and have a good outcome, and I want to be able to do this and not sin, if I want to be able to do this and not come across prideful and self-righteous, the second example is a better one for me to follow. So if you're asking yourself, what's my motivation? Step one is, what's my motivation? These two scenarios could actually help you answer the question. You could say, when I picture this conversation, do I picture it like, woe to you Pharisees? Or do I fix, picture it like, listen, my, my rich young friend, here's what I really think you need. Two very different motivations. Now, Jesus was right in both. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Jesus did the first one wrong and he did the second one right. He did both of them right. I'm just saying for me in my state, I can't do the first one that well. But I might be able to, with God's help, make some progress copying the second one. So check your motivation. That's step one. If you have checked your motivation, if you have said, there's a person I need to have a conversation with. I know I need to have it. And I've asked myself why. Why do I want to have this? And I've faced the fact that there might be a little justification in my heart. There might be a little pride. There might be a little self-righteousness. But I've confessed that and I've tried to move them aside. And really when I come right down to it, I love this person. And we've hurt each other. And we need to have a conversation to fix that. So it's going to be hard. I'm scared to death. But out of love, I want to go speak the truth and have this conversation and try to make this relationship better. As soon as that's your real answer, you're ready to move to step two. Until you can get to that real answer, you're not ready to move to step two. You've got to stay on step one prayerfully saying, God, change my heart. God, help me. Because step two isn't easier. It's harder. So once you're sure your motivation's okay, then your second step I call plank and spec. Now you might know where this is going, but in case you don't, I'll read the scripture it comes from. Jesus said this to his followers and he says this to us. Do not judge, for you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Ouch. There's more to this, and I'm going to read it, but it's hard to even get that far without even saying, wait a minute, the way I judge other people is the way I'm going to be judged? I don't know if you're like me, but here's how it works for me. I judge myself by my intentions. I judge everyone else by their actions. So for me, I say, hey, that's not what I meant. I meant this to go this way or this way, and I'm judging myself by my intent. But what I do with other people is I don't care if they were intending to do the right thing. They did it wrong and they hurt my feelings. And I judge them on only the action. So if this is true and I'm going to be judged the way I judge, I'm in trouble. i gotta stop, I got to start changing the way I judge. In fact, I have to stop judging. <laughs> That's what this says. Do not judge, Jesus said, or you will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. This almost brings us back to step one check your motivation. But we're moving to step two. Jesus goes on to say, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? Oh, and then he uses the same words he used with the Pharisees. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck that's, uh, to remove the speck from your brother's eye. These are some hard words. But again, this is Jesus speaking the truth and speaking the truth for our good. How can I decide to have a conversation with you because there's some speck in your eye that I've got to pick out? There's some flaw in your life. There's something you said or you did that I've got to fix. How can I come to you with a conversation like that when I'm ignoring the plank in my own? When I haven't even taken the time to do any self-examining to say, what's in my life that could have contributed to this mess? What did I do that maybe made the relationship go sour? What did I do that hurt? What did I do that separated us? What's my part in this whole thing? If I'm not willing to look at those things first, this conversation is not going to work. So once I know my motivation's okay and I want the relationship to get reconciled, then I'm starting to look at myself and I'm asking the question before God, God, what's my part in this? Because I can't just come to you and say, look, we have a problem. We both know our relationship is strained. And the reason is because you did this. And you did that. 
and you keep doing this. If there's a speck in my brother's eye, there's probably a plank in my own that needs to be dealt with first. And so if there is, if you've self-examined and you have found that you have a plank that needs to be dealt with before you even move into the Matthew 18 process. In fact, bookmark this because next week when we walk through this process in Matthew 18, I'm going to tell you to lead with your plank. I'm going to say if you've discovered a plank, start with that. Go to your brother, go to your sister, go to your friend and say, I've got this plank in my eye. But we'll get there next week. Right now... We're just trying to decide if there is one. So how do you find out? How do you decide? You do what David did in the Old Testament. He prayed a very frightening prayer, a very real prayer. And it's frightening because I think he prayed it honestly. I think he really wanted an answer. You can pray this prayer and not really want an answer, but if you pray this prayer and really want an answer, God will search you. David prayed this, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Sometimes I pray that prayer honestly. Many times I don't. Many times I already know there's an offensive way in my heart. I already know I've done something to either offend God or offend another person, but I'm trying to hide it. And I think if I just sort of pray, God won't notice it that I can skim by it, skim around it. But if there really is some offense in my heart, if there really is some plank in my eye, and I genuinely have a blind spot to it, and I ask God honestly to search me and show it to me, he will. He will. Have you ever had that experience? Have you ever sat before God in prayer, and in your heart you're just going, oh no, God knows. And you realize you have to own up and say, God, I've been carrying around a plank. I've been carrying around this thing. And it's ugly. It's it's bad. It's, It's sinful. And then you confess it to God and hand it to Jesus and say, I'm sorry about this plank because this is one of the reasons you went to the cross. But thank you for taking it because what else would I do with this plank? Have you ever had a moment like that where you man, you just said, oh gosh, I have a plank and thank God for a savior. You've got to come to that point first before you go have a conversation about someone else's speck. And it's so fascinating to me that Jesus used those two images, a plank and a speck. Because I need those images to recognize that my bad can be bad. I want to think your bad's worse. I want to think you have the plank and I have the speck. And I'll pick my little speck out so I can see your plank. In fact, I can see your plank with my little speck because I can see around my speck and your plank's big and glaring. That's what I wish that said, but it is not what it says. It says I can't see around my plank to get to the little speck that's in your eye. So let's suppose I've done that. I've checked my motivation. Why why would I want to have a hard conversation with someone? Oh yeah, I love them. And I want this relationship to get better. So God help me. Um... Show me if there's anything that's in my way, some plank in my eye. or God, show me what my part in this is. And I will tell you honestly from experience personally and from pastoring for 25 years, it is hardly ever, I almost said never, but you you can never say never, I've been told. It is hardly ever a one-sided event when a relationship gets strained. It's usually a two-sided event. Usually there are two people involved. I've done something and you've done something. And one might be bigger than the other and one might have gone first and the other one might have been responding, but it's still both people. Usually when there's something in a relationship that gets strained, both people need to fess up to something. Usually. So once you've gotten to the point where you said, okay, I've, I've examined my heart before God, and I have discovered my part in this. And remember, next week I'm going to tell you that's what you lead with, your part in it. Um, then you're ready to move on to the next step. Um, it's actually number three. And this one is to gain some perspective on what you're responsible for and what you're not responsible for. Paul said it this way in Romans. I had an aha moment with this verse sometime years ago. 
Um, it says this in Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And typically I would read that verse, maybe you would read it the same way, and I just hear the last part. Live at peace with everyone. God says live at peace with everyone. Jesus wants us to live at peace with everyone. Jesus wants us to be peacemakers. It's my job to live at peace with everyone. That's true, the verse says that, but I've skimmed right past the first part. That was my aha moment. And I discovered it in trying to help two other people who were in a tough spot relationally. Uh, It was a husband and wife deal, and one of them was trying to reconcile, and the other wasn't. The other just didn't want to. And I read this verse, and I saw it totally differently. All of a sudden, it says in the beginning of this verse, if it is possible, live at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Living at peace with everyone has a qualification to it in this verse. It means that it might not be possible. It means there's only so much that depends on you. Now, this does not let you off the hook. Do not check out at this point. It says be responsible for what you're responsible for and don't be responsible for what you're not responsible for. So what are you responsible for? You. Your attitude, your motivation, your plank, your effort you're standing before god you're responsible for all those things your part in whatever happened own up what are you not responsible for the other person's response you can't control it what if you are really out of sorts with somebody and you've done the first couple steps and you're ready to have a conversation and you go to them with the with the attempt to reconcile and they just don't want to they're not ready can you make them No, you cannot change or affect their behaviors in that way. And as long as you feel responsible for changing their behaviors, this is not going to work. Now, it might feel like quitting. It might feel like, what do you mean? Do I just not try? That's not at all what that says. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, this means your job is to do everything within your power, everything you can, to make peace where there's not peace. You're just not responsible for the outcome. Who is? God is and the other person. You can't change a human heart. You don't have that power. So you can't bring conviction. You don't have that job or that responsibility. You can't go to a person hoping to convict them of their sin. Who convicts of sin? The Holy Spirit does. You can speak the truth, and if there's some sin involved on the other person's part, whose job is it to convict them? The Holy Spirit. If there's some action that needs to be taken by the person you're talking to, whose job is it to change their behaviors? God's. And I can say that because behavior change begins with heart change, and heart change is God's job. So actually for me, Rediscovering this verse with a little more balance in a healthier way kind of takes the pressure off a little. A little. Because I'm responsible for who? Me. I'm responsible for my actions, my behaviors, my thoughts, my words. I'm responsible to try to make peace. I'm responsible to confess if I've sinned. I'm responsible to go to the person and lay myself out and say, this is broken and I had a part of it. I am not responsible to make that person do the same thing. I can't. I can hope for that. I can pray for that. And of course, that's the outcome we want. And I can keep trying and keep trying because as far as it depends on me, live at peace with all people. The sad part is, it's not always possible. If it is possible, it says there. Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. So what's the answer to that conundrum? It's praying and allowing God to do the work on both people involved. That brings us to the next step. Pray. Pray before you go. Once you've checked your motivation, once you've done the plank and spec check, and once you've reminded yourself about what you're responsible for and what you're not responsible for, then it's time to pray. Praying for open ears, open heart, open mind for yourself first. Praying for the other person who might not know you're coming. They might not have had the benefit of 
the time it you spent preparing and getting ready to have this conversation. So be praying for an open heart and fertile ground. And of course be praying for restoration of a relationship or peace. If there's someone in the grace community who's, who's really far out there, your prayer would be, God, help me to help them heal and bring them back into the fold. That's got to be bathed in prayer. It's got to be washed in prayer because it's all about the human heart and that's the Holy Spirit's domain. So we've got to cover that in prayer. And we're going to do that. We're going to do that right now, actually. I'm going to give you a chance to spend a little bit of time in prayer. And I'm going to ask you this week to make this your assignment. To this week, go through prayer like this. Set aside some time. And it doesn't have to be a lot. A few minutes every day. Just say, um, God, is there someone I need to have a conversation with? Is there a conversation I've been avoiding? Is there someone I need to call or approach or get together with? God, is my motivation in wanting to do this right? Am I just trying to show them they're wrong and prove that I'm right? Or am I trying to heal a broken relationship? And Holy Spirit, if I'm carrying around a plank in this, show me my part. That's your prayer. I want that to be your prayer this week, all week long. And if God shows you someone that he thinks you should talk to, you start praying for that person and that potential meeting when it comes up that the Holy Spirit will go before you and, pray and prepare the way. Because next week when you come back, we're going to jump into Matthew 18, and I want your heart and your mind ready to go through that procedure. And it takes this kind of prayer and this kind of thought during the week to get ready for that. So I'm going to let you start now while the band waits for us. Uh, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and spend a little bit of time in prayer on these things. And I'll help you. I'm going to remind you what to pray for. The first one is what I asked you to pray for when we started is, God, is there someone in my Grace family that I need to have an honest conversation with? You might already know. You might, if you already know the person, you just start praying for them. But if you don't, the Holy Spirit will show you. God, is there someone in my Grace family that I'm supposed to have a, a conversation with? You pray that right now. yourself the hard question before God, why would I want to do this? And ask God, help me to see my true motivation in this and to filter out the poor motivation and to major on the right one. that I mentioned to you two Sundays ago that I think that as a family here at Grace you have to major on what your church is called Grace. Ask God to give you grace. Ask the Holy Spirit, what's my part in this? What's the plank I'm carrying around? honest. God, I'm afraid. The thought of this conversation scares me. But I'm responsible for me, so I'm going to trust you to give me the strength and the words and the ability to make this happen. Go before me, Lord. Help me. at your prayer all week. And now, Lord, I pray that you would continue speaking to us, that you would continue showing us how much you love us,
you would help us to let that love and grace flow into other people's lives, that you would give us courage, that you would give us determination, that you would give us commitment and perseverance and the wherewithal to follow through with this and have a hard conversation or a good conversation or an honest conversation, a phone call or a get-together or a coffee. That you would use speaking the truth in love, Lord, to heal broken relationships, to heal broken hearts, to heal wounded hearts, to heal disappointed or disenchanted people, to bring Grace Family back together from a little bit of the fracturing that has happened. God, we are all people in need of your grace. We've all said and done things wrong. We've all said hurtful things. We all have sinned and fallen short of your glory. We all completely depend on your grace in our lives. Help us, help us to be people of grace so that we can be like you, Jesus. In your name, amen. So Amanda's going to sing um, Reckless Love. And in this song, we recall that Jesus said, he, there's no wall he won't tear down. There's no mountain he won't climb. There's no shadow he won't light up. There's nothing he won't move in heaven and earth to come after you with his reckless, ridiculous love. So let's remember that, but let it also inspire us to be the same way. You right.
climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. God, we just thank you, Lord, for your love for us, your undying love for us, Lord. Father, we just thank you that this week that we would go into the world, Lord, and be reconcilers. Lord, that we would be a people of your word, that we would be a people who put aside our own feelings, our own thoughts, um, and our own ideas that we may be right, Lord, and be able to open our eyes to see you and to see your word and your command, Lord, and you would lead us by your spirit's power, Lord, into reconciliation uh, within the walls of Grace Church, Lord, and with every aspect of of our lives. Lord, we just thank you for all these things. We praise you in advance for what you're going to do this week as we come back next week to share some testimonies on how you have reconciled um, to each other, how we've reconciled to each other, Lord, and how you have given us the heart of reconciliation. We pray these things in your name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. If you could join us outside today, thank you for visiting with us and tuning in on YouTube. We know there was static on the line and we're still working on that. Uh, but if you want to come outside and join us for a limited coffee hour, also, the search committee wants me to let you guys remember that there's a calendar on the four-year table to pick up. It's the prayer calendar so that you can take it up and during your everyday prayers, look at the calendar and see the different segments uh, that the search committee would like you to join with them in prayer. So thank you very, uh, thank you very much for joining us today and have a great day in the Lord.